notes to cheat with because it's got so many, you know, things going on. He's one of the guys. He did 25 years in the Air Force, um, did uh, serving our country. Then he got out and then he, you know, continues education. I think uh, if you're an adjunct professor at uh, Eastern Florida, Ann Barry. Uh, he's also is involved in community care system. Uh, my community care is a, that it takes care of. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit about this about felons and you know trying to readjust them back in. And his wife and him had just started another thing. And, uh, you are not forgotten, which is which serves community here for kids and things. But uh, I want him to introduce him. Thomas and I worked together in the post office a few years ago. Um, we actually hired him and he turned us down. So, <laughs> but, but, but you, see, you see why? Because he's so involved in doing, you know, we, we talk because he's on the safety team, you know, at his church and, and I'm on the safety team at my church and we discuss different strategies and things like that. So we spend a little bit of time together because we, you know, we see each other playing a fitness. You can see he does better at it than I do. <laughs> but, no further ado, I'll say Thomas High Smith. better than getting with a bunch of people who believe in God and we can just share all our beliefs and just how much God has done for each and every one of us. You know, without God, we wouldn't be here. Amen. Amen. It's an amazing God that we serve. And I, I just, it just tickles me pink just to be able to just speak about the Lord freely and openly to everybody and just, you know, people not judging you. You know, a lot of times people look at you a little differently when you talk about God, but I don't care. I, I, I don't care what they say about me. So basically, uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm working with um, my community care. Pastor Jarvis Wash is the actual uh, CEO of that organization. And we're, we're running a reentry forum, reentry center. And we're helping felons that are, that, were, that are getting ready to be released within the next 90 days. And those that have been released for the last six months, uh, find employment, find transitional housing, Find, if they need mental health, mental health issues, we find mental, we take them to circles of care, or things of that nature, substance abuse, things of that like that. So we're just out here trying to, because they're returning citizens. They're not, Amen. we, we got to stop looking at them as just they're horrible people. Because a lot of times, when people think of felons, they look at felons as just bad people. But you can, you can go to jail for stealing something that costs a thousand dollars and you're considered a felon. So it's, and what were you stealing for? Maybe you were stealing something for your family, for them to survive, something of that nature. So we can't look at everybody as rapists and murderers that are coming out of jail. So we just have to, but we're here to try to give them a second chance and give them the, and God, and I believe God has placed me in this position because there were other jobs that I could have gotten and been other places, but he found the perfect job for me since I retired, he found this perfect job for me to help other people. And that's my passion, is to help others. Right. It's not, there's nothing more giving or more satisfying to help other people. You know, because, and it reminds me of a, a, a Bible verse that, that's what me and my wife used as a, one of our motivators. Hebrew 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So you gotta think about it. When you give to other people, because God's people are the poor. And we it says it in the Bible. So we need to make sure we take care of the poor and be and be there for them. And that's that is just satisfying. That is just an awesome thing to be able to do that. So I've talked about Jarvis's uh nonprofit. I can talk about my nonprofit. Well my nonprofit is called, well, my mine and my wife. I can't take credit. Because that'd be a problem. She already sent me notes. So I gotta make sure I go off her notes. But uh it's called You Are Not Forgotten Inc. And you know we I had the God gave me the vision for the name. Because it, it, it just came to me in a dream one night. You are not forgotten. And that's just what we're trying to do. And that, you are not forgotten Inc. is an organization designed to spread joy, uh, joy to children who are in foster care and who are just Kids in transition, homeless kids, people, because you got to think, when you look at homeless, we think of people living in the woods. But a lot of times, homeless kids are kids living with relatives, that, and it's not their home. Their families are displaced, and they have to live there, and things of that nature. And what we do, my, my wife 
originally came up with the idea when she was a teacher at Rockledge High School. She had a class, and most of her kids in her class were foster kids. And a lot of them, their birthdays weren't being recognized. So she, what she took upon herself was to make sure when those, when it was those children's birthday that she would recognize it in the classroom and make them feel feel welcome and feel honored to be, that people forget about those people. When you're in transition, there's a lot of other moving parts. So birthdays aren't the most important thing. A lot of times it's about, are you gonna be able to have food to eat? Are you gonna be able to have shelter? Are you gonna be able to have clothing? So you gotta look at, we're trying to give them just a little bit of smile on their face. Just something extra to make them say, hey, somebody really thought about me, somebody really cared. Okay. Because uh, um, then what we do, now we just do this for uh, students that who are in transition. So we did our first event last month and uh, we gave away uh, 14 gift, what's called birthday kits. And our birthday kits, uh, what we have in there is hats, plates, napkins, cups, birthday banner, and small gift, a small little token of gift that says you are not forgotten. This, we're not going out and buying them a PlayStation. We can't afford that. <laughs> uh, everything that we buy is 100% donated. It's, it's, we we, we, we uh, survive off of donations because we're, it's just she and I trying to make it happen. So. We're receiving donations from the community. Matter of fact, we got a donation from a young lady up in Titusville. She gave us $500 worth of toys for kids. So it was what a great blessing. And another friend of ours gave us a monetary donation. You know, God, he's sending it. It's coming slowly, but it's starting to happen. So as a matter of fact, we have another event on October 17th over at the uh, courthouse. And there's going to be 30 kids that we're going to be servicing at that time for the month of October. So they do it once a month, the organization that we're doing with. So we take birthday bags. Matter of fact, we have bags made with our logo on the side and we put, fill them up with stuff and give it to them. You know, the last time the kids weren't there, they had to take them to them, but hopefully the kids will be there this time so we can actually get a chance to just see the smile on their face. That's, that's more satisfying to me than getting a paycheck, is being able to put a smile on the kid's face because I have three children and I, I, when I can put a smile on their face, that means more to me than anything else in this whole world. So, and um, so we're doing that, and also our big goal is to uh, be able to establish, establish partnerships with bigger organizations like Publix, Walmart, you know, a Harvey's. Some of these organizations that can actually give us, you know, donate some things for us that we can give to the kids, so they can definitely be able to uh, see the things that we're doing, because. What we're doing is a, a gift from God. It's about giving back to the to His people, giving back to the poor, giving back, and it's best, especially giving back to the kids because the kids don't know any better. The kids don't have the understanding of that they're poor. Because you think about it, a lot of us when we grew up, we didn't know we were poor. We knew life was good. We enjoyed each and every moment, you know. Because I remember as a kid, I had a pair, I had a pair of school shoes, a pair of church shoes, and I had a pair of play shoes. Three pairs of shoes. But I thought I thought I was living high up the hall because I was like, man, I got these nice shoes. And they were canvas shoes. It wasn't nothing leather. It was about the cheapest thing you could probably get. But but we enjoyed life as kids. And it was just simple. We had maybe a couple pair, I might I think I had two pair of jeans. You know, it wasn't a whole lot of stuff that we had as children, but we enjoyed each and every moment. And that's what I want the kids to see nowadays. I want them to enjoy. It's not about monetary, it's about being able to just be there and make it happy, make them happy, make them excited. And you gotta be able to do things of that nature. And we, so we need to just all just give a little bit to just make the kids happy, you know, it's just, and I know a lot of you have grandkids and kids and things that have nieces and nephews. We just gotta be able to make them feel more part of what's going on. Cause it's, when you give it to them when they're young, they'll appreciate it more. They'll be able to grow up and have a better life and understanding that, man, people really cared about me and they really looked out for me. Because I look back on growing up, neighbors used to do stuff for us. And you know, you think about it, they cook, bake cookies and fix you sandwiches. But you know, that was a different time. You could go to your neighbor's house and hang out and they scolded you too. They also, if you did something wrong, they would whoop you. And then they would call your dad and your dad would whoop you when you got home. It's, just a, it's a lot different now. But, we still have to be able to get out there and make things, you know, make the kids feel 
as though they're part of society. And I, you know, I definitely appreciate coming out here and talking to you guys. I don't have, I'm a speaker. I speak at class every night on Wednesday and Thursday nights. So I don't want to just sit here and just ramble on and talk a long time because I could talk about a variety of different things. But I just want to tell you about the two nonprofits that I work for. What one I work for and one that I I'm the president of. My wife is the founder. She made sure she put that in her title. <laughs> so, but I'm the, I'm the president. But it's just I, nonprofits are important, but it's also about because nonprofits are here to try to help people out for the most part. You have some nonprofits that don't, but for the most part, most because we're small nonprofit and we're out here trying to help people. You got to look at the, we're looking at trying to help felons. We're looking out here trying to help children from our nonprofit because you got to think. When you think about felon, a lot of those kids that are in transition, mm -hmm. parents might be in jail right now, or prison, jail and prison. So, who who better to help them but the community to come together and let them know that they're that they're important? Because their parents aren't here to help them out. So we have to be the we have to be the bridge between those between the bridge that gap. We have to be there for them and let them know that hey, we're here for you. And as us as men, men of Christ, we definitely need to step up to the plate and be there more so. So I definitely appreciate each and everything. All right. What what things can you do, or what are you doing to kind of follow through with the felons once they get out of jail? I mean, is there any housing that you can help with? Or well, we're right now it's a volunteer program for them to come through us. So you, we have to talk to them and see if they want to go through the program. And yeah, we're trying to find transitional housing for them. Because I know uh, VLA has a lot of transitional housing for veterans, mm -hmm. things of that sort. Because there shouldn't be, if you're a veteran, you shouldn't be living on the street because there's a lot of housing out there for veterans. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to look at the felons as a whole because, well, our returning citizens as a whole and trying to get them somewhere to play, stay because there's really no affordable housing here in Brevard. We all know that, you know, because it's, it's, it's pretty expensive out there. And what we're doing is work, trying to partner up with a bunch of different places. Uh, <coughs> some people have homes that they're talking about they want to let us have so that they, because we, we're, we're able to pay $25 a night for a bed for them to be able to stay for up to 180 days. So we're just trying to get them back on their feet. And this and, and that's another thing. We have to let them know that they're not forgotten about either. We have to be able to step up and be like, hey, let's try to find you a job. And a lot of times, the jobs that they want to give them are eight to $10 an hour. Where are you going to live with for eight to $10 an hour? None of, we all know you can't live off of that. You can barely live off of $25 an hour to try to go find somewhere to live. I'm just saying, I'm just being honest about it. It's just not a, a lot of housing out there. But we're, we're researching it. We're working on Matter of fact, we had a meeting with the adult ed over in Coco this morning about trying to get them, well, introducing the GED program while they're still in prison so that we can start the GED program for a lot of them so they, they can actually get their GED, work towards it so when they get out they can finish it up. So we're working towards that with them. And we're working, partnering with a whole lot of different other people trying to get some things taken care of. Yeah, we've had a couple of speakers from different homeless organizations, and they're hitting that same problem you are. I mean, there's it's really hard to find any affordable housing. Yes, you know, um, it's very hard. But if anybody knows where housing is, it's them. You know, yes. housing for homeless. Yes, we we talk to them. Where I, when I talk to BOA, they have a lot of they do a lot of interaction with a lot of these different organizations, so we can. And we're definitely touching base with all of them and trying to be able to find some different housing uh, avenues for people. It would be great if we could miraculously somehow find an apartment building with, <laughs> and be able to house people coming out of jail, but it's just not, it's just not that easy. In Brevard County, when you start looking at the pay comparable to whatever the, what it costs to live somewhere, it's pretty, it's pretty lopsided. And uh, some of the homeless groups that have come, one in particular, but I don't remember what its name was, they say if there's a veteran that's homeless in Brevard County, that, that shouldn't be true. Cause no, yeah, that's why I was, it's when I talk. by choice, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, it's by choice because yeah. VOA, had, they, they have over 150 beds throughout the county for to house homeless vets. And that's, that should, they should never be homeless. How old are 
So, you know, it's great. I'm a vet. I'm, but I'm look, we got to look at everybody. Nobody should be homeless as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Not living here. Yes. So are you explicitly or mostly supporting men coming out of prison? No, we're supporting men and women. And if you were to characterize what percentage of the folks that you're able to work with are men versus women? It's more men than it is there are women because there's more men in prison compared to what <coughs> the women population. Are, are you finding that there's some unique differences in how <coughs> you're able to connect with and help or even resources out there? Well, it's gonna, it'll probably it'll be a lot easier to place women than it will be for men because <coughs> a lot of times people don't feel comfortable with a man that's a felon comparable to a woman that's a felon. So it's, that's, that's the thing that you run into. And then, but there's so many more men coming back into the population comparable to women. Because if you got to think, how many women go to prison on a regular basis? It's not as many as a man. Yes, sir. What kind of program do you have to teach these people? Well, you know, we're going to talk to them about because it's it's coming through my community cares, which is an extension of the real church. So Pastor Jarvis will definitely be giving them some talk, talk to them about religion. You know. Pastor Jarvis, myself, Susan, or Charlotte, we're all religious, so we can all definitely give them, you know, let them know that God is definitely the answer. You just put, you have to put your trust and faith in him, and he can definitely make the way for you. Yes? Do you go inside the prison? Yes, we go inside the prison. We go, in, we go inside um, uh, 90 days before they're released, so we can start figuring out what they need once they get out. We, we start, we go in, we actually teach we actually start some programs, start teaching them. Matter of fact, a program that I'm going to be uh, running is called uh, 10 Steps on How to Be a, how to be a Father. Because a lot of them don't understand that aspect of being a father. You might be a, you might have helped to bring a kid into this world, but do you know how to be a good father? Do you know what the steps, what you need to do as far as, you know what, are we going to be able to reach everybody? No. But... As long as you can reach a few people, that's that's sure. that's all. That means a lot. So, um, are, are you familiar with um, Saint Peter Kramer? No, I'm not. Okay, they, they, kind of do, they do the same thing. Inside the prison. Oh, okay, they go inside they the prisons. The program, and the guys are gonna get out, and then they go inside, and I'm a part of that. And then uh, for a year, they mentor there and help them, you know, get their okay. mind straight to. You know, you gotta get all that prison stuff. Out, you know, oh yeah, because you know, because they come out, come out, they come out real guarded. Because yeah. you know, you're in prison, you, you're in a cell with another person, six right. by six, Yeah, so I've been there like thirty years, but they have to get readjusted. So yeah. my my part is, I go in prison, but for as part of uh, Saint Peter Claver Ministry, I'm one of the mentors. So when they come out, I contact them. I just I don't welcome them. Yeah, you just check on them. That's follow up. And I know Calvary Chapel does the same thing. I know there's a lot of churches around here that go and have prison ministries and they go and speak to the yeah. to the inmates. And that's the thing. We can go and try to talk to people. And you know, a lot of people, it's one of the things I, I've, I've been, been around people that have been in prison, know people from home growing up. A lot of people get religion when they're in prison. But it depends on what happens when you come out of prison. You know. Because everybody's reading the Bible and they got jailhouse religion. Jailhouse religion. And they, but is that going to be your religion that you're going to stick to once you get out of jail? Or are you going to try to go out here and do everything you couldn't do for the last so many years? And that, a lot of times it's, they go do whatever they can do because they haven't been able to do it for the last so many years. So it's just, it's just about trying to do, we're trying to do God's work. We all, we all are. We're trying to just touch people and give them God's word. And all they have to do is just trust and believe, and things will change for them. But a lot of times, do they trust and believe? Well, now, do you get like a list uh, of people who are coming out? Yes. Okay. So yes. You... We get a list of the people that are getting ready 90 days before, and we get a list of the people that have been out for the last six months. So we just touch base with them, especially the ones that have been out. You touch base with them, you ask them, hey, we, we send them fly. Matter of fact, while they're in prison, we send them flyers and letters to let them know what we have to offer. Because all the people who we help are people coming back from prison that were 
incarcerated here in Brevard County that are moving back to Brevard County. So we help the Brevard County residents. So, and so we send them letters, flyers, let them know what services we have to give, and then once they come back out, it, we'll go in and identify who wants services so when they come out, they can come right over there to us and we can start helping them out. Because we'll have clothing for them, we'll have uh, food if they need some canned goods and things of that nature. So we're gonna try to do some different, because I know there's some other places with clothing and stuff. We're gonna send them there, but we're gonna have little stuff for them just to start them off, but then we're gonna give them to the right, hand it off to the right places, because we're partnering with a lot of different places. Yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't know I was gonna ask, what does your program entail? What is it? How do you, you come alongside them? So they come out of jail, and then what exactly do you do? What we do is we, we try to find housing. Mm -hmm. We try to find uh, jobs for them. We give them, we, we check on their mental stability as far as that <laughs> substance abuse, if they have any issues with that. Just because you're in jail doesn't mean you're not using drugs. Right. So they can get there and there. Yeah, you can do whatever you want to. So, And we're trying to help them out as far as uh, clothing, things of that nature. There's so many, it's, it encompasses a whole lot of different education. If you want, a matter of fact, uh, another thing we talked with uh, Adult Ed over there, they're getting ready to build a new building if nobody knew. And, uh, of the Adult Ed over in Coco, they're building a new building, they're gonna be doing some more trade school stuff as far as like, uh, they're gonna have welding and mm -hmm. some other stuff. They're gonna be doing some more hands -on. Stuff that people said we didn't need anymore, but <laughs> we need more so now than we ever did. Because my dad was a welder at Chrysler for 30 years, so I know how important welding is, but a lot of times people, oh no, we got machines. No, you need people to make sure stuff works. Well, we need really HVAC, we need plumbers, we need all of these. And that's Christians. Like yes. And the thing about it was, we got rid of all of those trade schools. We got rid of all that stuff. We don't need, everybody needs to go to college. I'm a college professor. Let, let me tell you, not everybody's cut out to be a college <laughs> Not everybody's cut out to be a college student. A lot of people, because I had a, a young man in my one of my classes, I was seven, he was in there, had his head down sleep. You know, so we had a conversation. I was like, hey, what drives you? What, is, what, what, what is your motivation? He said, I love working on cars. I said, dude, we need to find you a So we, we looked for him an auto mechanic yeah. class for him to be in, because that's, Sitting there learning about statistics or whatever class you're in is not going to be what you want to do. Not everybody wants to do that. So some people want to go out and learn a trade. Yes, sir. What's the average length of time of people that you're helping? How long have they been in prison? It varies. It varies. You can have people in prison 25 years, or you have some people in prison for two to three years. It just depends. And you know, you, when you're dealing with people like that that have been incarcerated for 25 years, they have no clue what's going on. Right. You know, when they get out of prison, they don't know anything. They don't know how to use a cell phone. They don't know how to use a computer. They don't know how to do anything because they've been locked up for that. Institutionalized. Yeah, institutionalized for like 20 plus years. That's, that's a long time. And they're, and they're making it rougher on them now. Because you used to be able to get education while you were there. It, they don't make it that easy anymore because they don't. They want you to. They're serving hard time. When you talk to state peni state penitentiary, that's hard time. So they're not trying to make it easy on them. And they and um, Susan, our uh, reentry uh, coordinator, she worked at the prison CFRC right there on 528 going to Orlando, and she said they talk to them like dogs. Yeah. So they don't treat them like they're human beings. So when you come out, you're going to be guarded. You're not going to be feeling comfortable to talk to people. Because at first, they wanted to make the reentry center by the sheriff's office. So when you get out of prison, you don't want to go anywhere where law is. <laughs> Just think about it. Would you want to, if you've been locked up, do you want to go somewhere where law enforcement is? Do you want to go in the same building that law enforcement's in? That's not what you want to do. You want to be somewhere where you feel free to talk and free to speak. They're going to be guarded regardless. But at least they're in a better situation. Yes, sir. Um, one thing I didn't hear you mention was transportation, the challenge of transportation. Oh, what, oh that's another thing. That, oh, OK. Another thing we're going to be doing is buying them bus passes. We're going to buy them bus passes. We're going to buy them a cell phone. We're going to give them a cell phone. It'll be their cell phone. We'll pay for the first month, but they have to be able to start paying on their own. Because we're going to go. What phone or a smartphone or what? 
it's gonna be the dollar, whatever Dollar General or some. It's probably a smartphone. It won't be a flip phone. It'll be a smartphone, but it's gonna be a not something base that's model. Base model, yeah. yeah. It's not gonna be the iPhone 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, they, wouldn't they be eligible for the similar phones that uh, people with low income get granted? The model phone. Like, yeah, well, the, they might be. But we're gonna. It might be something to. Yeah, we'll help with it. Okay, okay, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We'll look into that. But yeah, we're gonna be able to. We're gonna try to. So we will be supplying with bus passes. Because that is, those are necessities of transportation yeah. and communication. Oh yeah. Well, you think of Maslow's hierarchy. You know, the, when you start talking about the bottom levels, you're thinking about you have to have shelter. You know, food. Yeah. You gotta have. You gotta look at the different things that you need to to survive and be successful to be able to survive. And that's the thing. Because one of the classes I teach at uh, Eastern Florida is called Success Strategies. And it's supposed to be called Success Strategies, but I talk about life. I want to teach you about how to be successful in life. What do you need to do to be successful? And that's one of the things that I want to talk to them about. And I already know they're behind the eight ball. You come out of prison, you have a felony on your record, you're behind the eight ball. A matter of fact, a story, my, my brother was, uh, he's an ex, uh, ex felon. He's a, he, in 1992, he got in some trouble, but my brother's recovery. He's a quality man manager at Catalong. He makes probably about $75,000 a year. So he's doing, but he's one of, he went and got his degree, but he's one of the people that pushed through it. It was, it was from our upbringing mm -hmm. to where you, you make sure that you need to do what you need to do. But he just fell with the wrong people. But it's a thing, that's what I'm saying. So you're just every, because you're just, because you're a felon doesn't mean you're a bad person. Everybody has, they have slips in their life. Think about it, when you were younger, how many people drank and drove when they were younger? <laughs> you know, you think about it. What if something would happen and you ran somebody and killed them? You're in jail, you're in prison. So we're no different than a lot of the people that have been in prison. Yeah, just, we're just, God blessed us to make it past that and we didn't end up, you know, in a bad situation. So, any more questions? <clears throat> hey, I want to thank you guys and you know it was a pleasure and an honor to definitely come out and speak to you guys. And, I, hey, God puts you in, the, in some of the most uh, challenging situations at times, but he puts you with a bunch of great people at times too. And I definitely thank you guys. For, for, you're some awesome guys and you do up. And what you're doing here is our head and heels above the rest of whatever a lot of people are doing, and I thank you. Thanks, sir. Say a prayer for us. Oh. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, as we close this, close this lunchtime, Lord, we just thank you for just the opportunity to come out and speak and just the uh, opportunity to hear the questions and just know that we're with a bunch of passionate, caring young men, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunities. We, that you, you bestow upon all of us, Lord. We thank you for just giving us the guidance. And Lord, we especially thank you for waking us up this morning. And Lord, we just thank you. And we want you to just continue to guide us down the path that you have set for us, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you do. These and other blessings we ask in your precious name. Amen. 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 Nice meeting you guys. I got to